So what does a digital detector do in a digital communication system? And here I've shown the channel, and the output of the channel goes into a demodulator. And the demodulator takes the signal back down from the carrier frequency back down to baseband. And if you want more information about the demodulator, there's a video on the channel about matched filters, which explains the demodulator and shows this form, which is a decorrelating demodulator. And why do we say decorrelating? Well, you take your signal and you're going to be correlating it with a sinusoidal waveform at the carrier frequency for the in-phase component and then the 90 degree quadrature phase component. And then you integrate over the symbol period and then you sample. So you sample at integer values of the symbol period capital T, that the digital symbols are going to be changing every capital T. And then you sample it. And so the digital detector is the next box and that's the thing we are asking ourselves here. What do we do in the digital detector box to transfer these samples and make decisions about which digital symbol was sent? That is the digital detector and its job. So I'll just say one thing or two, a couple of things first. We're assuming that we know where the start and the end of the symbols are. So we know, we know capital T, but we're assuming we know where the start and the end is. And that's something that you have to do in the receiver. And that's called timing recovery. So we're going to assume we know that. We also assume that we've got a very accurate carrier frequency. So the, the oscillator here in the receiver needs to be oscillating at exactly the carrier frequency that the transmitter was. So we're going to assume that, and that's called carrier synchronization. And we're also going to assume that we know that we've got the phase lined up. So that the phase at the receiver and the phase of the transmitter oscillator are lined up. That's called phase recovery. So those three things happen in the demodulator. So now in the detector, we're getting a, a component for the cos and a component for the sine. That's 90 degrees out. So again, these are waveforms, continuous time waveforms, but they're now being sampled. And now let's look at one symbol and where they uh, appear on the constellation diagram. So let's consider a case, for example, here where we had four constellation points. So that means four different symbols that could be sent. And don't forget, we often we call this real and imaginary, but we can also think of this as the cos wave component and the sine wave component. So this point here, it's always important to remember uh, each of these points is a, uh, I'll just draw a picture here, each of these points represents a sinusoidal signal that has come from the, uh, uh, from the transmitter over a period of time, capital T. And then you've taken that sinusoidal signal, you've correlated it with a cos, you've correlated it with a sine, and you've seen, which means projecting it in the direction of cos, projecting it in the direction of sine, and then sampling the output to see how much of a cos and how much of a sine. And so here we have the cos component, here we have the sine component, <coughs> excuse me. And so now here, if we had four different symbols, as we do in QPSK, quadrature phase shift keying, here would be the four signals on our constellation diagram. And for more information on constellation diagrams, there's a link in the description below the video. But here, just make one observation. So in the detector, what we would have to do if we had uh, the additive white Gaussian noise channel, which is what I've drawn this for, so at the output, in this case here, the output y equals x plus n. This is what I've drawn here. Well, I've actually only drawn y equals x, but then there's noise. So at the receiver, the constellation that you receive at the receiver will in fact have a cloud of points. If we plotted lots of points after each other, lots of symbols that were transmitted, and we receive lots of different symbols. And for each symbol, we're going to put their point on this diagram here. So for each symbol that's come through, because there's noise in the channel or noise in the amplifier, uh, it, which uh, is in your, uh, before you go into the demodulator. And so that noise causes these samples here not to be exactly at the locations of the constellation points anymore. They're going to be offset from that and they'll offset by an amount given by how strong the noise is. And so it's random, so you'll get a cloud of points if you received the constellation points at, uh, at the receiver and plotted them uh, before you go into the detector. If the, these two samples here on X and Y, you would see a cloud of points. 
And then one thing the detector could do in this case is simply put decision boundaries along the axes for this QPSK case, and then we could say, for example, if this was the one that was sent, then if the if your received point after the noise lands anywhere in this region here, then you would make a correct decision. That's something that you could do in this additive white Gaussian noise case. So this is the receive constellation, and to work out the bit error, the symbol error rate, for example, uh, you would say you would look at your uh, symbols, and when you receive them, you could in the detector you could say if the symbol lands well, after noise, if it lands in the same quadrant that it went in then uh, you don't make an error. Uh, and the detection could be you're going to assume that that's what you do in your detector. So what you could do in your detector is simply get your receive signal and map it to the closest constellation point. And that would be have the effect of what I've shown here is it would, it would give you no errors as long as the received points land inside the same quadrant that the transmitted point was in. Okay, so what about more complicated uh, scenarios? So let's look here, for example, at 16 QAM. So here we've got 16 QAM. Uh, this one was QPSK. Uh, so in 16 QAM, there's more points. And so now the situation is ex exactly the same as here, but there's more complicated because there's more points. There will still be, we're still looking at the additive white Gaussian noise channel. So you'll still receive clouds around each of these points, but now the decision boundaries, are, there's more decision boundaries. So for example, there's a decision boundary. Uh, what you need to do is you need to look at, put the boundaries where they are between points. So there'll be a decision boundary vertically here uh, between these row of points and a decision boundary along the axis here and a decision boundary between these ones halfway and then there's horizontal decision boundaries as well so there'll be a decision boundary here along this axis and between these points. So now what we can see is there's different symbol error rates for different symbols that are transmitted. So for example if this symbol was transmitted then you wouldn't make an error as long as the noise causes the result to land within that box. Uh, but for this one out here, as long as it lands within this box, which is a much bigger box, then you're not going to make an error for that symbol. And say, for example, for this one, if as long as it lands in this uh, more rectangular box, then you're not going to make an error if that one was transmitted. So if you're wanting to work out the symbol error rate for 16 QAM, you now need to consider each of the different types of boxes separately and work out the probability that the Gaussian noise would be smaller than the distance to the edge of the box. So in this case, there's four of these boxes. So you could work it out for this and then multiply by four. You could work it out for this and multiply by four because there's four of these at each corner. And you can see there's actually eight of this type. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you work out this one and multiply by eight and then take the average. That would give you the symbol error rate for 16 QAM. So this is again something you could do in the detector for 16 QAM is you could decide these decision boundaries. Okay, so these are for additive white Gaussian noise channels. What if the channel was more complicated? What if, for example, it was a fading channel? So in a fading channel, you're going to have an equation y equals hx plus n. So the, the signal, the symbol that's gone in has now been multiplied by the channel gain, which is a something that you don't know about. Uh, you have to measure it at the receiver and what it's doing is multiplying by the uh, phase, by a phase and an amplitude. And so, for example, here it has had the effect of rotating the constellation by uh, by a rotation and also a scaling. So in this case, for example, here, the original points would have been on the 45 degree lines, but now the points have been rotated because of the channel. So now in the detector, its job is to apply uh, new decision boundaries, which are, uh, have rotated decision boundaries. Then you can do the same procedure as before. In, you can look, you can find those decision boundaries and then you can work out the, there'll be a cloud around them, of course, because of the noise. And so the, the channel is effective rotating them and this gives a cloud around them. And then again, you can work out the bit error rate for this region here. 
Uh, and also, you're going to have extra difficulties in this case because you have to estimate H as well. And the more general case, uh, another example, for example, is when you have intersymbol interference. And this gives us possibly the most general case. I'm going to show this here without the fading rotation, just with uh, if it was just straight uh, intersymbol interference. So let me say into and let me draw it with two. So intersymbol interference. If we had two components, so at y at time k equals x at time h naught x of time k plus h one x of time k minus one plus noise. So in this case, intersymbol interference. If h naught, I'm going to draw it for h naught equals one and h one equals one eighth. So if h naught equaled one, if if h one equaled zero, if there was no intersymbol interference and we considered QPSK, we would have these constellation points. But if we have h one equals one eighth, it's adding in an extra component, and what that's going to have uh, is the effect of you're not going to receive points at these locations anymore at these these two numbers here are not going to be the real imaginary, are not going to give you these points anymore because they're going to be interfered with by the intersymbol interference from the previous symbol. And if this is an eighth, hopefully you can see that this is going to give us four points located around each of the main constellation points from the symbol at the current time. So instead of the dot in the middle, we're going to receive uh, the it's going to come as the dot in the middle plus one of these four constellation points from the previous con uh, symbol, data symbol, multiplied by one eighth, in this case, one eighth. And so I'm drawing this here. Hopefully you can visualize this. And of course, it's going to be much more complicated. So I'm going to actually put a white out uh, here in just so that you can really highlight and see that you're not going to be receiving that point in the middle. You're just going to be receiving a constellation that looks like this. And of course, it becomes much more complicated if you have more components of ISI and if they're not nice and one and one eighth like this. Uh, and also, again, as with fading, it may be that these are rotations, not just uh, amplitude scalings like I've shown. They might also be rotations and each one might have a different rotation. So the main constellation might be rotated a certain amount. Uh, that would be H naught. And then the sub constellation, the carryover would be a different amount. So you have a different rotation. And of course, if you've got more than one ISI component, you'll have much more complicated modulations. So in this case, you can see you could still use the original decision boundaries, but now the intersymbol interference is pushing you closer to those boundaries, and the noise, of course, is still there, which I haven't shown here, and this is going to create more errors. So if you have intersymbol interference, unless it's very, very small amount, if it's anything uh, more than a very tiny amount of intersymbol interference, then you'll need to do something more sophisticated in the detector than simply decision boundaries. And we have things such as the decision feedback equalizer and other equalizer structures. And you can see links in the description below the video. And one final point to make is that this type of constellation also happens for the case of multi-user interference. So it's not just ISI, but it's also multi-user interference. For example, in multiple, cell, multiple cells or neighboring cells in wireless cellular communications. And so the, the interference, this one in that case, would not be from previous times of the same user, but from different users. So this would rep, this would be, a, the, the equation here would be y at time k equals h of, of x1 uh, at time k plus h, oh that's h1, and h2 of xk2 for user 2 plus nk. So this would be user 1 and this would be user 2. And then depending on h1 and h2, you get similar constellations to this picture here. And again, in, in this case, you'd need to use sophisticated multi-user detectors in this detector box. And again, there's videos on the channel about multi-user detection. So if this video has helped you, um, please give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page in the link below, a description below, where there's a full list of all the videos on the channel.